to Bristol Community College and the fifth anniversary of One Book. My name is Susan Susan Moore. I'm one of the One Book Committee members, and it is my honor to introduce our president, Dr. Jack Spraga. Well, thank you, Sue, and th I want to thank the committee for arranging this uh, wonderful event, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, some of you, I want to, uh, I think it's your first time at Bristol Community College, and I want to welcome you to Bristol Community College. Uh, we have some honored guests. We have 100 honored guests from Durfee. Uh, everybody, want to give us another five minutes so you can catch your breath from the walk over, but thank you very much for coming. Uh, our Upward Bound class is here, and... Uh, uh, Dean uh, Sarah Morrill and the, the Upward Bound students. Uh, <clears throat> we have many people from the community. We have, of course, uh, BCC students, faculty, staff. Uh, and uh, some of you may be interested to know that the one book uh, is uh, offered in approximately 30 of our classes this year, this semester. So it's a terrific way to uh, in infuse the book. Yeah, we're very, very happy about that. And it's wonderful to see the faculty from various disciplines and the various uh, perspectives that would come uh, from, from the book itself. And uh, as a historian, I've appreciated uh, uh, Nathaniel Philbrick's work uh, uh, for many years. Uh, the Mayflower uh, book was just uh, outstanding. You know, we historians, professional historians, I like to consider myself that, uh, uh, kind of write in a stodgy uh, fashion and we're not well known for our fluent verse and uh, uh, to have someone uh, uh, come forward and tell the history story but tell it in a way that brings it to life and makes it makes it interesting and uh, readable and uh, makes you want to go out and read more of his work uh, I think it's really a gift and, uh, and we're honored to have him with us I, uh, I might say as I said the Mayflower was a very uh, very important book for me uh, I also, I have to confess, though, I had a disaster. I thought it was going to be a hilarious opening to a one uh, faculty convocation when he, he wrote a book about uh, Moby Dick, uh, Why Read Moby Dick, and I started the issue right after the contested uh, presidential election in, uh, with President Bush II. Uh, and uh, so I thought it was m marvelous that... Uh, uh, the the uh, reference was to a contested presidential election and a war in Afghanistan back, and this was back in the 1850s when Melville wrote. So I thought this was going to be hilarious, and uh, he just died. It just uh, no one <laughs> no, no one cared, and they wanted to keep moving. But uh, yeah, it's uh, I I want to uh, introduce to you now uh, uh, Connie Trepanier, who was instrumental in the one book. Uh, uh, committee, uh, and I want to uh, thank everybody who participated in, the, in this uh, great project from year to year. And Connie, I'm going to invite you if you could come up and uh, introduce our speaker. Thank you very much, everyone. <clears throat> Good morning. My name is Connie Trepania, and I am a member of the One Book Committee. In the heart of the sea, the tragedy of the whale ship Essex is BCC's fifth one book project. Over the course of the next few months, students, faculty, staff, and administrators will read, discuss, debate, and celebrate in the heart of the sea. But there is no better way to appreciate a tale, pardon the pun, than to get inside the head of the author. Mr. Philbrick kindly agreed to squeeze in this visit, and I want him to know that he has made a lot of friends here at BCC today. Am I right? Nathaniel Philbrick earned a BA in English at Brown University and an MA in American Literature from Duke University. He is an avid sailor and he and his wife Melissa sail the waters surrounding Nantucket Island where he makes his home. Philbrick published In the Heart of the Sea in 2000. He has written and edited several sailing books and some of his other titles include Away Offshore, Nantucket Island and Its People, Sea of Glory, Mayflower, The Last Stand, and Why Read Moby Dick. 
His latest book, Bunker Hill, A, si a City, A Siege, A Revolution, was released in April of this year. Feature film rights have been optioned for both In the Heart of the Sea and Bunker Hill. In the Heart of the Sea won the National Book Award for Nonfiction and was the basis for a 2001 Dateline special on NBC, as well as the 2010 two-hour PBS American Experience film, Into the Deep. Mayflower was a finalist for both the 2007 Pulitzer Prize in History and the Los Angeles Times Book Award and was winner of the Massachusetts Book Award for Nonfiction. The list of awards goes on and on. It would probably be easier for me to tell you the awards Nat Philbrick has not won. So without further ado, it is a great honor and privilege for me to introduce the author of this year's one book, In the Heart of the Sea. Please give a warm BCC welcome to Nathaniel Philbrick. Okay. Hey, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. It is a real pleasure to be here and, and to speak not only to you here, but to Attleboro and New Bedford. Hey, everybody. Uh, great to have you all part of the discussion. And it's a real honor to uh, have In the Heart of the Sea named part of your one book program. Uh, it's, for, as a writer, you don't know how important it, it means to have groups of readers such as yourselves engaged in a community of reading because uh, for me the act of writing has been a direct product of the communities in which I live. I have lived on Nantucket Island now for 27 years. I can't believe it's been that long but we moved with my wife Melissa in 1986 when our kids were one and four. I grew up in the maritime capital of the universe, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, so, so Nantucket was a little different. But I have to say, it wasn't after, after being there a few years, I really became interested in the history of Nantucket. I thought I knew about Nantucket because I had read Moby Dick. And there is chapter 14 in that great novel entitled Nantucket. It was a crushing blow a few years after moving to Nantucket to learn that Melville had never visited Nantucket prior to writing Moby Dick. Such is the power of literary imagination. But what I began to realize is that having uh, what Nantucket was in the early 19th century, when it was the whaling capital of the world, meant that the island was very different from what it's become, the, the summer uh, seasonal community, the tourist mecca uh, that we think of it as today. Back in the 19th century, when whaling was king on Nantucket, Nantucket was the mobile oil headquarters of its day. Uh, this was when instead of drilling holes into the sands of the Middle East or Texas and extracting petroleum, you killed whales, ripped off the blubber, boiled it into oil, and it was the Nantucket whale oil that was lighting the streets of London and Paris, was lubricating the machines of the uh, emerging industrial age in this little island 30 miles off Cape Cod was the center of it, and it was an industrial port. And I began to realize that it wasn't all that um, irrelevant for me to have grown up in Pittsburgh when it was the steel capital of the world. And that, in fact, I had grown up in one industrial community and was now in a place that had been 200 years before my time, the industrial, an industrial center in America. And in fact, when America was still very much an outpost, a, a new nation trying to get its feet on the world stage, it was Nantucket that was showing this nascent nation how to, how to become a world power because Nantucket were, truly was a global community. Uh, the, the first white settlers arrived in 1659. They, uh, at a time when the island's native community is, it's been uh, estimated could have been as large as 3,000, which is huge. This meant that, um, and on Nantucket, there were the, there, it wasn't until the 1720s that uh, the English population began to outpace the native population in terms of numbers. So that Nantucket was a profoundly native place when whaling began in the late 17th century. It began uh, uh, as 
right whales became, became was, were the, the, the whales that they initially fished, you, uh, building 25-foot open whale boats that they would set out from the south shore, uh, kill the whales, drag them back to the beach on the south shore, cut them up and boil them up uh, into oil. Then they got larger vessels and would equip them with brick triworks, furnaces. That meant that they could go out for not only weeks, but months at a time, trying out the oil uh, at sea, turning these little vessels that were only 40 to 50 feet long into little factory ships. They, by the early 1700s, they were getting as far as almost an Arctic Circle. By uh, the years prior to the revolution, they were making it to the west coast of Africa. They would get down to the Falkland Islands. And then after the revolution, which, destroy, which temporarily destroyed Nantucket's whale fishery, after that was over and, Nant and Nantucket was part of this new nation, the whale fishery would hit its, its most important phase when it, they penetrated around the Horn into the immensity of the Pacific Ocean. And when the Essex left, left Nantucket in 1819, uh, she was a, a typical Nantucket vessel. This was early in Pacific whaling, and uh, Nantucketers were still learning about this great ocean. And up in, at this point, most of the fishing involved the coast of, of South America. But by this time, Nantucketers were doing to the Pacific what they had done to the Atlantic. They were fishing it out. And this is the story of, a, of resources. You know, we, we are um, now at a time where we, get, we have, are fully appreciative of how fragile the Earth is when it comes to its resources. In the 19th century, Americans in particular viewed uh, nature as, as their bounty. It was their God-given right to go out there and, and get those fishes and uh, turn them into oil and light the streets of, of the major cities. And one of the defining characteristics of Nantucket was that it was a Quaker, largely Quaker, whaling port. As Melville said, these were Quakers with a vengeance. When it came to human beings, uh, they were pacifists. But if you were a sperm whale, you quickly realized that they had a very different attitude towards you. These were some of the most ferocious and effective hunters the world has ever known. They had uh, worked their way into the Pacific, and by 1819, they were beginning to fish out uh, the west coast of South America. The Essex was captained by George Pollard, a first-time captain uh, in his late 20s. First mate Owen Chase uh, uh, was younger, but someone uh, who, who was described as a fishy man. And when that was a term, Nantucketers were very sophisticated when it came to leadership issues. Because uh, for centru by a century now, they had been sending out ships, small groups of people. You know, the, uh, Essex had 21 people on it, uh, very tightly organized in a hierarchical system. If you were from Nantucket, you were on the fast track to a, an officership at some point. If you weren't from Nantucket, you were known as a coof a term for an off-islander, and uh, you were basically labor, and uh, that was the, kind of the attitude uh, that prevailed. But when it came to leadership, the, the, the Nantucketers were quite sophisticated, and they realized that the best kind of captain was a fishy man, a man who, whose sole mission in life was to kill as many whales as possible, boil them into oil, and fill his ship in hopefully less than two years' time, although it was getting harder and harder to fi find whales, and so the voyages were extending to as many as three years. And Owen Chase had clearly defined himself as a fishy man. George Pollard was, uh, had proven himself to be an excellent first mate, but now he was a captain and uh, had to establish himself in this new rule and uh, new role. And Nantucketers realized that there were many excellent first mates whose primary job was to uh, act as a, a buffer between the captain and the crew, to take the captain's orders, implement them to the crew members, and, and act as a go-between. A different set of skills from the leadership required of a captain. And so uh, as things would emerge, it would become clear that Pollard was less of a fishy man and more of what was termed a lifetime first mate 
in that he had the skills of creating consensus and getting thi and and implementing those those orders rather than being that strong leader whose uh, word was was law and what would emerge is that and a lot of my books are about leadership and in the heart of the sea uh, it's a central uh, part of the story and when you're reading it if you haven't read it yet look at the leadership roles of, of Pollard and, and, and Chase because I think they will define a lot of uh, the, the, the leadership situations you've already experienced in life and the leadership situations you will experience in life because leadership is one of those elements of, of human existence that uh, you encounter in all sorts of, whether it's your summer job or your, your, the, your career, professional career, career later in life, uh, it's very fascinating to see how different personalities adapt to the demands of organizing people and leading them uh, in the various tasks that life require of us. The Essex left in August of 1819 just around the time when a, a baby was born in New York named Herman Melville, which is an interesting uh, uh, parallel, the Essex would head around the Horn and quickly learn that they were fishing out of uh, uh, the Pacific on the west coast of, of South America, and they would resolve to go to a newly, newly discovered whaling ground, the appropriately named offshore ground almost 3,000 miles off the coast of South America, farther than any Nantucket whale ship had ever gone before. On their way out there, uh, as they were following the equator, almost like it was an invisible lifeline, they stopped at the Galapagos Islands, a typical provisioning stop for Nantucket whalers, where they rounded up dozens of Galapagos tortoises, averaging 80 pounds, some of them more than 100 pounds. And what a Galapagos tortoise was 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 incredible, uh, ma low maintenance provisioning uh, uh, creation for Nantucketers. A uh, Galapagos tortoise could live for a year with no food and water, and provide uh, the Nantucketers with wonderful fat and meat, what they needed for the, in the diet, particularly out at sea. And so they loaded, they stacked these these tortoises like like wood in the hold, leaving some of them even to walk the deck of the Essex. They made their way farther and farther out into the offshore ground. They were almost 3,000 miles off the coast of South America, smack dab on the equator, about as far from land as it was possible to get, when on November 20, they spotted a huge pod of whales. Now, when you're writing about uh, something in the past, evidence is everything. And up until fairly recently, most of our knowledge of the Essex disaster was based on the, the, the account written after it by first mate Owen Chase. It was published soon after the disaster in the fall of 1821. It was not until 1980 that an account came to light that had never before, that was thought lost, written by first mate Thomas Nickerson, just 14 years old when the Essex departed. And I was fortunate enough to get access to this journal, and uh, meaning that my account was the first to include Nickerson's account. And although his account was written much later in life, it provided a very different perspective from an officer on a voyage, trying to put a voyage that did not go particularly well in the best possible light. Uh, Thomas Nickerson was just 14. He had had a birthday, so he was 15. Uh, on that day of November 20, when they set out in pursuit of this huge pod of whales. Nickerson was on Owen Chase's whale boat. They were about to, they were about to throw a harpoon into a whale when they were slammed, their whale boat, this happens all the time, were slammed by the tail of a whale, opening up a hole, water rushed in. They cut the harpoon and began to stuff their jackets into the hole in their whale boat, rode it back to the ship, 85-foot whale ship, much smaller than the Charles W. Morgan, that you, which you may have seen in Mystic Seaport. And they brought the whale boat onto the deck, and Chase was uh, one of these hard-driving guys, wanted to get out there because it had not been a good whaling voyage up until now, and here were all these whales. And so he's furiously 
using a hammer and nails to nail in a piece of canvas on the broken, shattered portion of the whaleboat, Thomas Nickerson is at the helm of the Essex when he sees something remarkable. He looks to the side and he sees the largest sperm whale any of them had ever seen before. 85 feet long, as long as the ship itself. And it was behaving strangely. It was sitting on the surface of the sea. Its huge block-shaped head pointed towards the Essex. But they weren't particularly worried because never before in the history of American whaling had a whale been known to attack a ship. Chase continues to nail that piece of uh, canvas to the, the whale boat. And then the whale begins to move towards the ship, dives down, and when it resurfaces, this whale is going much faster than it had been when it first dove down. And it was heading directly towards the side of the ship. By this point, it looks like it might slam into the ship. The men who see it cry out to Tommy Nickerson to hard up the helm in an attempt at an evasive maneuver. But it's too late. This huge 85-foot whale, and it was about a ton of ton per foot, so this whale was 85 tons, slams into the side of the Essex, knocking every man off his feet, sending those, sending those Galapagos tortoises skittering like hockey pucks across the deck. The whale goes underneath the ship, surfaces, bringing the ship up like it's going rocking in the midst of an earthquake. And then the whale surfaces on the starboard side of the ship, its head towards the bow, its tail towards the stern, knocked out cold, floating beside the Essex. This is a big whale. If they can kill this whale, they will be going a long way towards filling the ship with oil. Owen Chase takes up the 18-foot spear known as a killing lance and motions to stab this whale that dared attack a ship, but he notices the tail is only feet from the rudder. If he should provoke this huge creature and it took out the rudder, they would be 3,000 miles from the coast of South America without a way to, and potentially disabled. In a rare moment of caution, Chase does not throw the harpoon. It's Thomas Nickerson. Chase makes no mention of the fact that he had this opportunity in his account of the Essex disaster. It is because of Thomas Nickerson's account that we know of this. And as Thomas Nickerson would write, if Chase knew what was about to happen next, he would have risked the rudder. Suddenly, this whale springs to life. And now, this is an extremely angry sperm whale. Sails, uh, uh, swims at a very high rate of speed to leeward. And then it does a behavior typical of an infuriated bull sperm whale. It begins to snap its jaws with a percussive force that could be heard for miles. And they're all just watching this creature. And then it takes off again, swimming at a very high rate of speed ahead of the ship until it's several hundred yards from the Essex, where it turns around and begins to swim towards the bow of the Essex, once again at an accelerating rate of speed. They're watching this huge 85-ton creature, its tail 25 feet wide, working up and down, creating a whitewater wake as this whale is headed towards the bow of the ship. Once again, the men cry out to poor Tommy Nickerson to hard up the helm. Once again, it is too late, and this creature slams into the bow of the Essex, crushing it as if it were an eggshell, and even, according to one account, driving this 238-ton ship backwards. They're just hanging on. The whale ex eventually extracts its head from the fractured timbers of the Essex, Essex's bow and swims off, never to be heard from again. Well, if you've read Moby Dick, or at least you're familiar with Moby Dick, you know that that great novel, and since I did write a little book called Why Read Moby Dick, you might suspect I, I'm a Moby Dick fan, that novel ends with the white whale sinking the Pequod. But where, and it's based, and Melville makes it very clear in Moby Dick that he is basing his novel on what happened to the Essex. Essex. 
But where Moby Dick ends is just the beginning of what happened to the real life story of the Essex. The ship begins to fill up with water. Now, I don't know if any of you have seen Titanic. Well, if you've seen Titanic, you know it takes forever for the Titanic to fill up, and wa fill up with water as it sinks. Kate and Leo have plenty of time to run around the ship. The men of the Essex did not have that kind of time. The Essex was going down very quickly by the bow. They had a spare whaleboat up on the rack over the quarter deck. And so Chase and, and his men began to prepare to launch that. But it would be the African-American steward who would save the day. He realized that they were 3,000 miles out to sea. If they didn't have navigational gear and guides, they were lost. So even though Pollard's Pollard's cabin in the aft portion of the ship is filling, rapidly filling up with water. He goes down below and comes up with, with those instruments, compass and, and other instruments. He comes up onto the deck, and by this time, the ship is beginning to cant to the side. As Chase and his men have, have got the whaleboat on the side. They're, they're beginning to put it into the water. The steward jumps into the whaleboat. They swim. They row away as fast as they can, and then with an appalling slosh and groan, the Essex capsizes. Doesn't sink right away, it just lays there, floating on the surface of the sea. And they sit there in their whale boat, stunned, looking at what had once been their home, now a wreck, floating on the surface of the sea. About this same time, on Captain Pollard's boat, miles away, they have harpooned a whale and are being dragged away when one of the crew members looks over his shoulder and sees an incredible sight. He sees the Essex disappear. He cries out, what ails the ship? They turn and look where the Essex should have been. It's gone. They immediately disengage their whales and begin to row back as fast as they can towards where the Essex had been on the other side of the horizon. They come up with all sorts of scenarios as to what had happened. It hit a rock, hit a storm, something. None of them involved what had actually happened. Pollard's whaleboat is the first on the scene. He rows over, can't believe what they see. He rows over to Chase and he says, my God, Mr. Chase, what is the matter? These men were men of few words. Chase looks to Pollard and he says simply, we have been stove by a whale. And thus it begins. What do they do? They, they, this was early in Pacific whaling. And the whale, if you've been to New Bedford Whaling Museum or Nantucket Whaling Museum, and you've seen those whale boats, those are from a later era when they got, grew as up to 34 feet in length. These were just 25 feet long. And they were not equipped with sails or centerboards. They were just rowing dinghies. Here they are, out in the middle of the ocean. They realize, well, whatever happens, they have a voyage ahead of them. So they begin to scavenge sails and, and rigging from the ship, and they rig up their whale boats as little schooners, and they, dig, they, they expand the sides of them so that waves cannot slop over the side. And Chase tells us that this is a modification that was absolutely crucial um, to their survival. And then they get some of those Galapagos tortoises. They find some hardtack bread that is the consistency of a brick and some water. And they load up each of the whale boats, all three of them, and then they have a decision to make. Where do we go next? The three officers, uh, Pollard, Chase, and second mate Matthew Joy, have a meeting. And they look at the chart. The, wi the trade winds blow from the south, from the south east, blowing them away from South America towards the islands of the Pacific. The, looking at that map, the thing to do would be to sail with those winds towards the Marquesas. They would have been there in probably less than a week. That was clearly what they should have done, and that's what George Pollard proposed that they do. But as Owen Chase and Matthew jo Joy pointed out, they didn't know much about those islands. This was very early in Pacific whaling. In just a year's time, those islands would become the provisioning ground for Nantucket whalers. Hawaii would become the base camp, the other home of, of these Nantucket whalers. But at this stage, they knew very little. The only thing they knew about the Marquesas were rumors, rumors of cannibalism. 
that there were cannibals living on those islands. And when you're in the midst of a disaster situation, it's your fears, not your objectivity, that drive you. And Chase and Joy said to Pollard, look, we don't want to become a meal for a cannibal. We, look, we are whalemen. We know the sea. Let's make our way back to South America, back to a known and civilized port. We have provisions we think that if we put ourselves on a starvation diet where we can last for two months, if we sail south, not towards South America, but south for a thousand miles and then get to what's known as the band of variable breezes where we'll turn left, that'll take us about a month. And then if things work out after another month, we will be on the coast of South America. We will be living skeletons, but we will at least be in a civilized port. Pollard, rather than, usually the captain's word is law, but Pollard listens to them and says, okay, if that's what you want to do, that's what we're going to do. As Nick Chase's account, he doesn't make, he makes it sound as if they had decided to go to South America from the beginning. Nickerson is the one who explains that this, this transpired, and as he says, it was the fatal error. Because instead of everything going right, everything would go wrong. Within just a few days of leaving the Essex, they were attacked, get this, by another whale. A killer whale would uh, attack Pollard's boat at night, playing with the whale, attacking this whale, play, playing with the whale boat as if the way a cat does with uh, the mouse, you know, batting it back and forth, bashing, terrifying. Finally, they beat it, beat it away, but, uh, uh, and they had to repair their vessel, but they continued on. They quickly realized that, initially at least, they weren't going to starve to death. It was dehydration that was the problem. They were, you know, those little bottles of water, you know, you can get those little ones, that's what they were drinking that much a day. And they were under the searing sun uh, all day with no place to hide. It's just impossible to retain enough fluids to, to survive for any time. And after about a month, it was clear that many of them were on the verge of death. It was then that they miraculously, and this is almost biblical in what, how it unfolds, they find, they see an island, Henderson Island. It's out in the middle of nowhere. No one lives on it to this day. It is, it is uh, now a, a, a source of scientific inquiry because it is so remote that scientists study it as, as a, an incredible little ecosystem. For the, for the men of the whale ship Essex, it's, they, they, they look all over, can find no water, and yet at dead low tide, coming from a rock is a stream of fresh water. Oh. They were not going to die of dehydration, at least not yet. But then they, and they go around, and there's birds all around, and they take, the, take their, the eggs, and they kill the birds. But within a week, they've killed everything within uh, where they can get. And they realize they're not going to last. They're not going to all be able to live on this little island. This is a little metaphor for <laughs> what humanity is doing to this planet. They realize they are still 3,000 miles from South America. And they realize, if we stay here, we'll just die. We got to head out again. And so they make that terrible decision to head out once again to South America, three of the crewmen, very smart crewmen, one from England, two from Cape Cod, announce, good luck to you boys, we ain't going with you. We're going to stay right here. Uh, and, uh, so, and they're all fine with that, because that's fewer mouths to feed out on those ships, they, on those whale boats. They head out, and I won't go into too much detail because that's why you have to read the book if you haven't read it yet. Uh, one whale boat would be lost and never seen again. Two of them would survive. Uh, but the great and terrible irony of this story is that as they began to suffer from starvation, they began to realize they, any of them were going to survive, they must do what they initially had feared was going to be their fate. They would have to subsist on the dead bodies of their crewmates. They must become what they had most feared. They must become cannibals. There is a more, uh, and, it, and it was on Pollard's boat, where it would boil down to what is the supreme 
moral dilemma when it was four Nantucketers, three of them teenagers who had all grown up together, one of them the much younger cousin of Pollard, where they realized they had nothing left. If the, any of them were going to survive, they needed to sacrifice someone so that the others might live. This is known as the custom of the sea. The Essex men were by no means the first to resort to this last desperate measure. And then they would draw straws to see who would be sacrificed so the rest could live. Once again, I'm not going to go into the details of who gets what. I don't, that's a spoiler alert here. I'm not going to go there. But those are the kinds of choices that define people and, the, uh, and that none of us know. People often ask me, so how, what would you have done out there? And I say, well, you know what? I would have curled up, sucked my thumb, and got into the... Uh, you know, bottom of the whale boat and said, <laughs> I'm done. I mean, this is, this is hard. And yet, who knows? Because the survival instinct is way beyond anyone uh, can predict. I've, I've had readers who say, how could they have done that? And I say, look, we have no way of knowing. Unless you have suffered those kinds of things, there's no way of knowing what you would do. Uh, five people would emerge from the whale boats alive, all of them from Nantucket. They would make their way back to Nantucket, and all of them would return to the sea. Pa uh, Chase would, was destined to become one of the most successful whalemen Nantucket has ever known. Pollard, on his next voyage, uh, uh, which included two crew members from the Essex. Can you believe that? They went with him. There must have been some real faith and trust in him. Uh, he, uh, including Thomas Nickerson. They would head out next August. I mean, they were just at Nantucket for a few months before they headed out again. But fate would follow Pollard. They would round the horn, and off, south, off Hawaii, they would hit what was then uncharted French frigate shoals. The ship would be pounded to pieces on the shoal at night. The order was to get to the whale boats. Nickerson said they had to drag Pollard from the deck onto the whale boat. Luckily, they were rescued the next day. But as Pollard would say to a missionary in, of all places, Tahiti, one of those islands they could have gone to, back home I will be judged an unlucky man. Yes, he had that right. He would live out the rest of his life as a night watchman. And on, on Nantucket, the Essex story was very difficult. Uh, this, it be, the, the story, Chase's account, would be published soon after the disaster. And it would become a story that um, was widely known. This was the Donner Party before the Donner Party. Uh, you know, we think of the West as America's primary wilderness, the defining frontier for this country. But before there was the West, there was the sea. And the Essex disaster was a, a story that had much to defining uh, America's emerging sense of itself as a nation in a huge and vast global uh, world. And Pollard would live out his life as a night watchman. And in 1852, the year after the publication of Moby Dick, none other than Herman Melville would visit Nantucket for the first time. Can you imagine it? The author of Moby Dick and remember, Moby Dick was not a great success. It wasn't until the 20th century that it was rediscovered and became recognized as the great American novel. For Melville, it was a crushing uh, professional blow. Uh, people did not like it. People did not read it. And even though Melville knew, he had written an incredible book. He goes to Nantucket in July of 1852. His father-in-law is, uh, is Justice Shaw, uh, and, and a circuit judge. And so Melville goes with his father-in-law to Nantucket, stays at what's now the Jared Coffin Inn, and at night, in fog, meets none other than George Pollard, the night watchman. And in Melville's copy of Owen Chase's narrative, the same narrative that he had read while working on Moby Dick, he would write late in life in green crayon, because by that time his eyesight was failing, and so he needed to, he wrote in crayon. He would write, sometime in the 1850s, visited Nantucket, med, met George Pollard, to the islanders a nobody, but to me the most remarkable man 
I ever met. Now that is a character endorsement. And I think Melville, looking into the eyes of Pollard, this twice fate-blasted man, saw an uncomfortable sense of what was ahead for him as his literary career would head into the darkness. Melville would die in the 1770s, almost forgotten, and yet found on his writing desk would be the, the, the manuscript for Billy Budd, what's now recognized as one of the great novellas in American literature. And so there is some redemption for Melville, but clearly for him, the story of the Essex was an indispensable part of not only his great masterpiece, but the process by which he tried to come to terms with the legacy of the great novel he had created and the career that was left to him afterwards. And before I turn it over to questions, I, I'd just like to say um, it's, it's, uh, this is a story I've obviously lived with for a long time. Uh, the, the, I first wrote about it in my uh, book, History of Nantucket Away Offshore, and then wrote In the Heart of the Sea. It was published in 2013. And so that was 13 years, uh, 2000, and that was 13 years ago. And now, um, uh, it's, uh, as was mentioned, it's now, uh, at the, as we speak, uh, in London, uh, uh, Ron Howard is, is filming um, uh, a movie based on In the Heart of the Sea at the Warner Brothers lot where they, they filmed Harry Potter. And they've got this huge water tank where they have a replica of the Essex and where a a lot of it's being filmed. They've created a waterfront of Nantucket. It's amazing. They've built this, this town. And, and um, if you follow Ron Howard on Twitter, uh, he posts pictures of, of the stage. And it's been very, it's a very funny thing to have worked on a book, to now see it sort of emerging in a different way. It's a, a whole collaborative, it's a very different uh, process. But what's amazing to me is to is is to to see what you know for me was was something that came from the archives came from the diaries in which i was trying to create characters that were true to what we know of what transpired and then to have this happening but then the the real corker was last february uh, it was announced that an archeolo underwater archeological team working on French frigate shoals off Hawaii, guess what they found? The remnants of Pollard's last whaling vessel, the two brothers. And for me, that was amazing to think that physical remains and what they found were the tripods, the, the harpoons, all of the iron associated with the ship. The wood was all long gone, but they were able to, uh, thanks to the, uh, initials engraved in some of these objects. They were able to identify it uh, as Pollard's ship. And so, so for me, that's what history is all about. It's, you know, I think it's so easy, uh, particularly when you're, I was a student, to think, you know, oh, it's a bunch of dates and it's boring and it's dull. No, man, it actually happened. <laughs> and it's real people. And, you know, and, and the, the remnants of what happened is still out there. And these are stories that I think, um, you know, can inform us and hopefully help us as we work our way into the future that uh, is, will always be the great mystery. Thank you very much. Well, I, uh, if anyone wants to ask me a question, feel free. They, uh, they've got microphone, I think, on either side. So people can go to the microphones and get in line there. And uh, I'll work my way one at a time through them and try to, try to answer. Yes? Thank you. Uh, uh, in your book, uh, as you noted yourself to us, you end with uh, the, uh, uh, a moral crisis Previous to that, you made reference to uh, the, the miraculous uh, coming upon the island. Something that intrigued me in your book about midway through, something that really stood out, and I was surprised to come across it, was the white members of the ship meeting with the Afro-American members of the ship in a spiritual experience. 
praying together. Uh, is there some connection, not just stating the history, but uh, do you see something, because you're suggesting it to us, that there's something in the, in the human element that might have been taking place on this here ship and with the team and the crewmates uh, as it goes through your story? Yeah. Well, you know, spiritual, spirituality um, is, uh, when I was working on this book, I did a lot of research uh, into survival situations, not necessarily maritime situations. I looked at what happened in the, uh, during the Holocaust in Germany uh, during World War II and, you know, other survival situations and, and tried to get a sense of, you know, how do people do it? You know, how do people make their way through these incredible ordeals? And one of the things you, you uh, one of the elements that uh, is very important to people is a sense, is spirituality in many instances, where they look for something beyond themselves. And, and as you mentioned on the Essex, um, you know, remember, a lot of these Nantuck white Nantucketers were, came from a Quaker background. And so they, and a Quaker meeting is, is if you've ever attended one, is, is a little different. It's quiet, you know? You, 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 and then if someone feels the word within them, they stand up and speak. But it's spontaneous. It's not a, a kind of ceremony that uh, is commonly associated with a religious you know, worship. Uh, but, uh, and, and then there was a large African-American group on this ship. And uh, there was, there's one uh, African-American, older one, a co cook, who um, uh, the, in several accounts, they refer to him being the one that begins, starts leading them in worship. And, uh, and I think it's kind of an extraordinary scene where you see you know, these people from very different backgrounds. And remember, a ship is a little microcosm, you know, where uh, people have come from various areas, but on a ship, uh, uh, there was a sense of, unlike on shore, where if you're in the middle of a storm, you don't care what color the person is. You want to just make sure they can do their job. And so um, it's, it's just a different sense of, you know, of humanity there. And I think when it came to the ordeal in the whale boats, you, you see that happening. And you see how uh, people can really get sustenance from their, their spiritual beliefs even if they're coming from very different points. Yes? I, I yeah. I, the only, this is the first novel I've ever read that was interesting. <laughs> Matter of fact, this, your book is the first novel I've ever read. Oh, great. I was amazed how what bravery steps they took go, catching, um, catching whales. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 whale, the whaling, is that, should I talk about that, the, the whaling? Part. Yeah, that was the cool part. The what? That was the cool part. Too. Yeah. Well, it'll be very interesting to see how it's portrayed in the movie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can thank Denise for showing me the book in the first place. Okay. Yeah, that's Denise DiMaggio right over there. Okay. <laughs> I look forward to reading the rest of the book. Okay, well, great. All right, hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Yes. First of all, thank you very much for coming. It was an honor to hear you speak about your book. One of the things that I really loved about the book, it was that it was easy to read, meaning that it really resonated, unlike a lot of other history books. Could you talk a little bit about how you approach writing? Yeah. Um, you know, I come from, I was an English major in college, so I, I took relatively few history courses, although I have to say in high school I had a uh, a American history teacher who had a profound influence on me, Miss Wilt. Uh, we still exchange Christmas cards. I cannot use her first name because she will always be Miss Wilt. But, um, and she really, she, I just look back, she just really uh, gave me, uh, she really encouraged me in my writing, uh, which, and looking back, it, it made a real difference. And, um, and I, you know, I, my professional training is not in history. I'm by no means an academic historian, but what I, uh, I was trained as a journalist. I, I used to work at a sailing magazine. It's now called Sailing World. It's actually in Newport. Uh, it was when I was there, I had a different name and was based in Connecticut, but it was there that I, uh, I was there for four years and then I freelanced for it for a number of years. And it was there that I sort of 
develop, had people uh, uh, reading my stuff, other editors critiquing it, you know, that kind of thing. I learned how to interview people and all that. And I, be, you know, and it, as a journalist, you're trying to create a set, you're, you're, it's characters, it's people you're tr writing about, and you're trying to let the reader know what happened and writing in a very clear way. And, and so my approach to history is that I, I am uh, trying to tell a story. I am writing a narrative uh, that uh, is, is uh, using archival sources, is using primary sources. The work of academic historians is absolutely essential to my process. Uh, but I am not sort of making an academic argument uh, I, as much as I am just trying to figure out what the heck happened. <laughs> uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, every one of my books, I don't, uh, is about something I don't know that much about, but I'm curious about. And so for me, the excitement is the learning in, and, uh, and is getting into the primary sources, finding those voices, those very specific details that tell us as much as everything. And so for me, it's a process of trying to find out as best I can what happened and then telling the story. Uh, and and it's, it's, uh, writing clearly is the hardest thing on earth. <laughs> and um, and I, I, uh, I'm, I write and rewrite and edit and all that stuff. It's, each book takes at least three years. Uh, and, and, uh, but for me, each book has, has been a voyage of discovery. I, all my books are about America. I'm not doing it in a chronological way but I, I am trying to work my way uh, and try to figure out what this country is about. And people will say, well, oh, I already know about the pilgrims. Oh, I already know about the little bighorn. And I say, no, that's not, I know what, you know, I tell you, if, if you, if you, yeah, I know, uh, what, if you, I know who George Custer is, but you don't know who George Custer is until you really look into it. And so I am really trying to find as best I can what actually happened. And each book has been a surprise. And um, I just try to uh, communicate some of that sense of, of wonder and discovery uh, to the reader. Yes. So first of all, I just wanted to applaud you because um, I find it so admirable to dedicate yourself to something like this and, and really look into it. So I, well, thank I really, you. Um, the, the other thing that I really find curious um, is what your feelings were when you found out that it was going to be made into a movie, um, whether you had reservations about it, because everyone knows the general consensus is, well, the book is so much better than the movie. Um, and the other one being, uh, are they consulting you in any way, shape, or form? Do you have any input into this whatsoever? So. Um, yeah, I'm ex you know, it's, it's, it's funny. It's an entirely different form, and I love movies. I, that's what I do for fun, because I'll, I read all day until my eyes fall out. And um, particularly when I'm on book tour, I, every night I, I try to go to a movie somewhere. I just love movies. And, uh, um, and it's the storytelling aspect of the movie, and I think visually. Uh, that's kind of sort of how I, uh, when I'm researching, I'm trying to get a sense of, you know, those kinds of things. But anyways, and, and um, and, I, you know, I, it's out of my control, really. Uh, and all I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I, I, I'm hopeful that a movie will um, be a good movie. <laughs> and I'm not so concerned that it be truthful to the book, because the book is a book. And if anybody wants to read the book, please read the book. Um, I just would like this to be a good, exciting movie. <laughs> and it does, I don't want this to be a slideshow of my book. Uh, that could be that would be deadly dull. This needs to reflect the vision of the screenwriter, the director. Uh, they need to have the freedom to just make it happen in the best way that they can. And so, and I am available as as long as it's helpful to them. And we just see where it goes. And I have to say, Ron Howard has been an absolute delight to work with. Uh, he and uh, the screenwriter Peter Morgan, who's doing has done the rewrite of the script. Um, met with me at Mystic Seaport. We had, we had lunch in the captain's cabin of the Charles W. Morgan. How cool is that, huh? <laughs> and um, yeah, and it's been fun. I, I've been getting emails of, with specific questions, things like that. But once again, you know, it's, 
they're doing it. And, um, and it's, I'm obviously very interested to see uh, how it turns out. But, um, but once again, it's just a different medium. And I, I just wish them the best of luck. And I'm, I'm not going to be the kind of person to say, oh, that's not the way the book is. That's not the point. Um, you know, the, everyone has, can go to the book. Uh, let's see what they can do with it as a movie. Yes. We have a question from Attleboro. Um, I think I missed a little bit. It, it's about the uh, characters being interchanged, did you say? Well, you have Chase, he's financial. You have Morgan, he's financial. Poland, who basically is a man, and he yeah. is a lot. So, do you think that the people then are kind of the families now that are involved in finances? Involved in finances? Um, yeah, it's just hard to, the, the hearing uh, is a little tough. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things is, um, and I don't know if I'm answering your question because it just was hard to hear, but one of the things that uh, has been very interesting to me is I have met descendants of some of the characters uh, of Owen Chase, uh, as of um, various other characters uh, and the, you know there's really no uh, no oral tradition that they hand down although um, uh, Ramsdell who was a survivor uh, and uh, the the uh, the descendants live in Pittsburgh of all places said that there was a family tradition that when it was time for dinner in the Ramsdell household you sat down and ate dinner because you know what happened to grandpa <laughs> on the Essex but uh, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, it, the Essex is about, you know, it has it's tough moral dilemmas and, um, and, a, and it was, you know, very difficult situations for them. But what's interesting is that after the disaster, um, every, see, people within the, the ship that survived seem to have stayed in relative touch. Um, but once again, it was not something that was widely discussed on Nantucket. Uh, there's a tradition of a young girl in the early 1900s asking, saying, what, asking her, her um, aunt, what is the Essex? I heard someone talk about the Essex. And the aunt said, Miss Molly, we do not talk about the Essex on Nantucket. So. Yes? So what rhetorical strategies did you use while writing the book? I'm just wondering for my AP language class. <laughs> what rhetorical strategies? <laughs> well, I'm not sure what that is, but <laughs> so I don't know if I can help you. But um, the one thing I have to say is um, <laughs> working on a book, uh, you got to remember, I wrote this book 13 years ago, <laughs> and uh, I hadn't read it for 13 years. Um, uh, until I was meeting with Ron Howard and this screenwriter, and I realized, you know, I don't, I don't really remember the book that well. <laughs> so uh, I read it, and it was like, whoa, yeah, okay, yeah, that's what happened. And, um, and w one of the things that it, it made clear to me is how unconscious the process is, at least for me, um, where I, reading it 13 years later, I go, oh, so that's what you were doing, you know? But when I was working on it, I really, you know, didn't see a lot of the things that I guess now I recognize as strategies and, and um, you know, what I was really trying to do was get out of the, not get in the way of the story. Um, and I had a certain number of sources, uh, but I also uh, wanted to, I was fascinated by the science of the story, whether it was the science of whales, whether it was the science of starvation. I mean, there have been scientific studies of starvation. And, um, and so I wanted to use that kind of information to help work up the drama of, because you know bad things are happening, but if you can 
get the reader to learn as, as sort of holding off the, the reveal, um, it, it, it was an interesting pacing kind of thing. And so I was, those were the kinds of issues that when I was working on it, I was very aware of. But a lot of the other stuff um, that peop have, people have referred to, so what were you trying to do there? I remember going, I, I don't know what I was trying to do. <laughs> but, uh, but so um, it's, 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 it's just an interesting process, yeah. Yes. Hi, you mentioned that they, um, most of the crewmen practically starve because of provisions and stuff. Why is it that in other cultures like Japan, where whale meat is considered a delicacy, they did not utilize that whale meat rather than throw away to the sharks after they took the blubber, the ambergris, and the spermaceti oil? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, there's, yeah, first off, there's nothing like a disaster to have the power of hindsight and say, why didn't they do that? It's so obvious they should have done this. What m makes a disaster so difficult is that you're in a situation you don't want to be in. No one is thinking clearly, and you're just trying to, you know, you're, you're, you're in many ways your emotions rather than your intellect is, is driving you. And yeah, the, you know, hey, they're, they were starving even before the Essex began. They, you know, there was a, a minor mutiny uh, even before they rounded the horn because it was very typical of these Quaker uh, whale, whale ship owners to under-provision the ships because it cost them less money. And, you know, why didn't, you know, they, people eat, eat whale steaks, uh, uh, but Nantucketers did not enjoy eating whale meat, and uh, having eat, tr tried whale meat, I can understand why they did not <laughs> eat whale meat. Uh, and, and so, but the other question is, after the disaster, you know, these guys are fishermen, why didn't they fish? <laughs> you know, why didn't they uh, make more of an attempt to catch, to catch uh, fish, those kinds of things? They made some attempt, but they're, they're overriding. And one of the things you find out in disasters is your, your frame of reference narrows. Uh, you, you are trying to save yourself. And as you're trying to save yourself, you come up with the strategy by which you're going to save yourself. And you, your peripheral vision goes. And they had decided that they had to get to the coast of South America as quickly as possible. That was what they were trying to do. And so everything that might delay that was not considered. And so, you know, they didn't, rather than spending some time in fishing and, and because it's very possible, and there have been a lot of survival situations where, you know, they're on a raft or something, and they get to the point where, okay, I'm, I'm surviving on the fish, I could be out here forever if I had to be. You know, that's possible. Uh, these Essex, Essex guys did not try, you know, it, they didn't, you know, there were, there have been situations, uh, starvation situations at sea where crew members used dead crew members as bait for sharks and then killed the sharks and ate them, uh, which is a gruesome possibility. But it just shows you there are different avenues down which they could have gone. There, when you read the journals, you just see their focus was to get to safety. And that's what they tried to do. And uh, the, the remarkable thing is that any of them survived. Yes? We'll just take these last two questions. OK. We'll oh, hi. <laughs> hi. Um, how did you feel when you actually found out that you, uh, that you actually made the book and then the book turned into a movie? <laughs> well, um, it's funny, because I sold the rights to it 13 years ago. And so, and in your ignorance, you think, wow, that means it's gonna become a movie. Well, no, it didn't. Uh, there, were, there were three or four times where it seemed very close, and, uh, and by the third time, I was getting a little jaded. And what you learn is that just because you sell the option does not mean it's going to become a movie. And in fact, the vast majority never become movie. It's, it's a real long shot. And so, I had, um, sort of uh, uh, resigned myself to the fact that this was probably never going to happen. And then it was about a year ago, um, a little over a year ago, that there was something about the actor Chris Hemsworth, you know, Thor. Well, he's going to be Owen Chase, that he was interested in it. And there was no director. And so I thought, OK, that's great. And then, and then it was another six months where I learned that uh, Ron Howard was potentially interested in. and then. 
didn't hear much. And then three months later, it looked like it was, you know, it all sort of fell into place. So it was funny. It was just a gradual process. And I'm just, I still don't quite really <laughs> understand what's going on, but we'll see. It's, it's kind of exciting. Yes? While researching for your book, which account did you think provided a more better and accurate view of what happened? Very good question. Um, it's funny because uh, Owen Chase's account had been the received wisdom of the Essex disaster. Uh, and it's a wonderful account. It's, it's, it's a kind of literature in its own form. It was clearly ghostwritten uh, uh, for Owen Chase. And in, uh, in the heart of the sea, I have a theory as to who it was, a very well-educated Nantucketer who, who also ghost wrote, wrote other books on Nantucket. And it's, it's, a, great, uh, and it's a great book. And, but you know, and if, and it doesn't take long in working in the historical realm where you realize every source, every person writing a memoir, a journal, an account, are telling it from their point of view. And, um, and they're telling it, and, and Chase was telling it as an officer of a voyage that didn't go very well, clearly trying to put what his uh, role in it in a, in a, in a good light, and in terms of, you know, and he behaved extremely admirably, uh, particularly after the disaster began to unfold. But, you know, you don't get all the side of the story. And so, uh, and then there were other accounts. There was a letter written by a whaling captain who had been uh, witness to the uh, statement of George Pollard the night after he was rescued. Can you imagine that? where you know, he is this living, breathing skeleton, where he feels this compulsion just to tell, tell what happened. And he seems to have told it with um, amazing detail, uh, unflinching detail. And so this person's account of that, of that account um, it was actually the first account to reach Nantucket. And, um, and so that's interesting, and that provides some information that's not in Chase, although it's clear Chase had that account when he was working on it. And then there's the, the Nickerson account, written much later in life, and, uh, and written uh, at the urging of a, of a professional writer named Leon Lewis, who was visiting the island, and had made uh, a reputation as writing bestsellers for boys. And, and heard that Nickerson had been on the Essex and said, you know, write this up and I'll turn it into a bestseller. Nickerson sell, uh, writes it up in a, uh, in a composition book very similar to the kinds that you can get in any stationery store today, sent it to Leon Lewis and never heard from him again, died in, in Nickerson's obituary. They say, we know he wrote an account, but it's, it appears lost. And it wasn't until 1980 that that account was found and then recognized as the long lost account of the Essex disaster. And it's, it's, uh, and I, I, I uh, came out with my father who's a retired English professor. We did a collection of the, all the versions of this story that I used in that book. Um, and Penguin is published by Penguin and you can get it. It's called Stove by a Whale. And um, you know that was a fascinating process to go through. Is you know find all these and you read Nickerson's. It's not a polished account the way uh, the Owen Chase is. Uh, it's clearly he was reading Owen Chase while he was remembering it, but he comes up with all sorts of stuff that I alluded to during my talk that isn't in in Chase. And so, but you know there's some stuff he he decided he couldn't reveal that at that stage in his life that he had they had actually eaten people. Uh, Chase makes it clear they did. Uh, Paul, uh, Nickerson, as an old man, preferred to say, no, no, we just had more bread. We, we, we made it through. And so that's the challenge as a historian, is to you try to get as many different sources as possible, weigh them against each one another, and try to come up with as best you can uh, your sense of what happened. Thank you very much. As a member of the One Book Committee, we'd like to thank you for coming this afternoon and meeting with Mr. Philbrook and sharing our In the Heart of the Sea experience. Um, 
please like us on Facebook. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you.